Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I am your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Ryan Fitzgerald, the Assistant Director of Intramural Sports at Indiana University Bloomington. We're here to take an inside look at collegiate intramural sports. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm really glad to have you here, Ryan. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think it would be helpful if we start with kind of an understanding of the different levels of sports offered on a collegiate campus. So um, I'll walk us through that, and then maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your area, which is um, the intramural sports area. Basically, there are three different tiers of sponsored sports on campus. We have the intercollegiate athletics, which a lot of people think about when they think about sports at college. This mostly includes recruited athletes who participate in highly organized and competitive sports under the eligibility requirements and rules of a governing body, kind of like the NCAA. And then we have another level, which are considered club sports, which is high level competitive play, often has tryouts, competes against um, other colleges. And then we have your area, which is intramural sports. And this tier of sports um, is where college students participate in sports against and with their classmates in either competitive or purely recreational format. Um, they take place on a college campus, are participated in by college students, really looking to socialize, stay active, learn something new. So what are some of your most popular intramural offerings at Indiana University Bloomington? Sure, yeah. So. Um, look, uh, we are in Indiana, so basketball by, by nature is a very popular sport for us. Um, basketball, uh, flag football, soccer, um, we have futsal as well, uh, which is uh, more of an, an indoor soccer um, style um, of sport. Uh, volleyball is very popular for us. Um, so a, a lot of your traditional team sports, um, spike ball and bags um, are, are also really popular for us as well usually fill up um, for us a lot of um, interested people um, within those sports as well. You said spike ball and bags? Is that what and you bags, said? Yes, cornhole. Can you bags. explain that a little bit more? What is that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so the two different sports. Uh, so spike ball um, is um, kind of new um, it, in a way. So spike ball is more, um, there's a net on the ground um, and there's a ball 2v2 or, or 1v1. Um, and it's generally played, um, sometimes played on the beach. Sometimes we, we play on like on our turf uh, field complex. Um, so spike ball and then your your traditional um, bag, your cornhole also known as, um, we, we have those tournaments as well. And then how many people do you have that actually participate in intramurals? Sure. Um, so uh, the, but this year, kind of coming out of COVID, uh, we had over 6,000 unique individuals um, who, who participated within our program, uh, which was really, really, really cool to see. Um, prior to COVID, uh, we, we, we were up near 9,000 um, or, or so. So uh, we are rebuilding, uh, but over 6,000 unique um, individuals on our campus who, who choose to participate within our programs. So put that in perspective for us, how many students go to Indiana University of Bloomington? What, like, what percentage of students are actually participating in intramurals? Sure, sure. So don't know the, the exact percentage, um, but thinking about like overall um, in terms of, of campus, um, venture to say we have probably over um, 30,000 people here, here on campus. So um, we, are gen we are definitely serving a, a great majority um, of our, our population here on campus, which we would always like for it to be more as well. Uh, well, in, in, you know, the intercollegiate athletics, the club sports, those are more um, competitive and restricted to very specific populations. So this is more accessible for the larger um, <clears throat> student population. Um, so you've worked in intramural sports for several years now at four <laughs> different universities. So you started at James Madison University as the intramural sports site manager and an official. Um, you were at University of Kentucky as a grad assistant for intramural sports. Then you were at University of South Carolina as a coordinator for intramural sports. And now in your current role as the assistant director of intramural sports at Indiana University Bloomington. So comparing those four different institutions, what kind of similarities and differences have you seen between intramural programs? Sure. 
Uh, yeah, great question. So I think um, generally speaking, in, in terms of how how those four programs are are similar, um, I I think we all at every place I've been, um, the goal is to program support um, for all of our students uh, on campus. So um, how that's determined, what strategies kind of go into that, um, kind of depends on leadership. Um, obviously within the Department of, of Recreational Sports at that, that institution, as well as where your uh, rec sports department aligns with the university. Um, so for example, is it under student affairs? Um, is it, it, like, is it not? So I, I think for the differences, we kind of come back to um, here, like here at, like at IU, we have a beautiful turf uh, field complex um, at JMU, we also did as well. Um, so just thinking about like resources in terms of like very simply put, like if it rains, do we cancel or or do we have a, like a playing surface where we are able to go out and, and continue to play? Um, I think that like across the board, I think most IM programs are, are run pretty similar. Uh, there's different twists, there's different uh, perspectives put on obviously depending on, um, again, those those bigger overarching goals of the uh, department that it functions with, within. But generally speaking, uh, we we try to do, um, at, like at the end of the day, we try to do what's best for the students, making sure we're programming, uh, making sure we're being inclusive, making sure that um, we have a very diverse set of offerings um, for, for people to come and participate with us. To meet the needs of, of various students. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, and so when you say <laughs> IM, that refers to intramural sports, correct? Yes. Is that the lingo yes. for, yes. for intramural sports? The lingo there, yeah. The lingo, the lingo. Yeah. Um, let's, let's transition just a little bit. You, um, in looking at your handbook for participation, you have a policy that allows for persons to participate in accordance with their gender identity, um, allowing individuals to select whether they can be in men's women's co-ed leagues. Um, so you also have an open recreational category and a residential hall category that don't have these restrictions or categories based on sex or gender. Um, so can you explain to me why are many participants separated by gender in mm -hmm. these different leagues? Sure. Yeah, good question. So um, for us, this is actually something we, we've looked a lot into um, this year. Um, we have we have met with colleagues on campus to answer that question as to why. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I don't have a perfect answer. Um, it's something we are still we are still looking into. We are still um, asking our participants um, what what our league structure should look like to be inclusive. Um, and, and we're we're talking with people to to really try to understand um, do do people like participating in a, a men's and a women's league in a co-league in an open league where there are no gender requirements um, so that's something we're actually currently looking into and working on um, to see how is that current setup inclusive um, for for everyone or does it discourage people to participate within our programs so uh, we are actively having those conversations. Um, that's that's kind of the way it's always been done. Um, is is the the kind of traditional men's women's co um, co leagues. Uh, we actually started this past spring. Uh, we have open leagues for every single one of our sport offerings. So we we are um, having those conversations again to to really make sure we are being inclusive uh, on campus for the students we serve. Yeah, and that's one of the tenets of intramural sports is to be inclusive to the um, community at large in, in, at the institution. Um, gender identity is in sport is a controversial issue regarding fairness at all levels of sport. Um, so you said this is sort of something you're in conversations with, but how long has your gender identity policy been in place and how has it been received by that Indiana University Bloomington community? Sure. Um, so the policy, um, the, the policy before we, we, we rewrote most of it uh, this past spring, uh, the policy in general um, was in place before my time um, here, here at IU. Um, and we truthfully made some changes because the previous policy was not well received um, by 
uh, by our student population. So uh, we we had some conversations. We've we've listened. Um, we've we've kind of sat sat at the table to to have those conversations, um, and that's where we've seen that that change this past spring. Um, some updates to to our policy, uh, the the way we word things. Um, man versus woman, uh, men versus woman, uh, female versus male. Um, how how do we um, use proper verbiage as well uh, within our policies um, to make sure that if somebody comes and they are interested in signing up um, and they see verbiage that is not very inclusive, that might automatically deter them from participating within our programs. So we want to make sure we are using the correct verbiage uh, to make sure that they they feel included uh, within our space. Yeah, if they don't see that the, a reflection of their identity that they can choose from to participate, then they feel like maybe they're they don't have a place in participating. So, um, you also have other rules that limit athletes who compete at higher levels um, if they compete in club, intercollegiate, professional sports. Would you say limiting participation of athletes that compete at a more you know higher tier is this more of a safety issue or a fairness issue? Sure. Um, I, I would say that it's a it's a mixture of both. Um, so uh, when we think about the the overall um, population of, of students who, who who participate within our programs here at IU, uh, we have both competitive and recreational leagues uh, for, for most of our, our sports. So people can sign up. Uh, we also do it in terms of, of fairness for those participants as well. Right. So when we think about the, the fairness aspect, as well as if you match a, an elite athlete within a, like a sport with somebody who might not have as much experience, does that then present a, like a safety concern um, for that person? Um, so that's that's generally why, why we have those policies in place. Yeah. And then and then I would think that there are people competing at a higher level. They're already getting support and opportunities elsewhere. And that may be taking the place of an opportunity for um, someone else who can't compete at that level or doesn't compete at that level as well. And I know part of the philosophy for intramural sports is that participants should demonstrate good sportsmanship. And your participant handbook, you cite the Webster's Dictionary definition that a sportsman is a person who can take loss or defeat without complaint or victory without gloating and who treats his opponents with, opponents with fairness, generosity, courtesy. So why is this an important aspect of your philosophy for intramural sports? Sure. Um, it, it's something we talk about from the first day in August uh, when, when we have our staff training um, until the last day of the, the, the semester in the spring. Um, for us, sportsmanship is more than being a good sport. Um, it, it helps us to create like an environment where I am should be a really fun place where people are, are able to come out, recreate with their friends, um, mix in a little competition in there. Uh, but but the purpose of, of why we have IMs on campus um, is to um, allow people to come out to recreate, as I just said, and, and just have a really fun experience. Um, so for us, sportsmanship gets factored into playoff eligibility, um, like into seeding. Um, so it's something we talk about often, um, and it's something we talk about during captain's meetings before games, uh, of just making sure that this is still an, an IU sanctioned program. This is still something that that is is representative of of you, um, and sh sh should still be following every policy you you follow, like in the classroom as well. So um, it's it's an extension. Obviously, sport by nature um, can can kind of bring some things out that we wouldn't have in the classroom. Um, but it is something for us that towards our our officials, towards our like our supervisors, making sure that that people are are being good sports um, and and they're they're having fun and the other team is also a, able to enjoy their experience as well. You know, I had a, an experience when I was a site supervisor <coughs> recreation where um, during basketball, um, a basketball game, a participant did not like the call from an official and became verbally aggressive towards the official threatening violence. And I sort of had to jump in the middle and intervene and um, help kind of manage that, that situation. So what are some examples in your years of experience where people have not been good sports and what were the consequences for that poor behavior? Sure, um, the, 
the list is is fairly lengthy, but uh, there's uh, there's there's everything from uh, like like you kind of mentioned uh, verbal abuse towards towards a staff member. Um, those are things we absolutely do not tolerate. Um, for us, all all of our sports officials are our students um, on campus. So uh, we are teaching them, we are training them, we are developing them um, as officials um, and berating them and, and yelling at them and doing those types of things are, are things we take very seriously. Um, and they're things that oftentimes come with game suspensions or, or at least conversations um, with us. Um, in terms of, of participants, um, it, it goes from everything from verbal altercations, with, uh, with other participants that can be resolved by by a quick conversation, as as your your example kind of says, or or we have entire fan bases um, that that are screaming and yelling and threatening, and and um, and then we have to clear the entire sideline, right? We have to like remove everybody. Um, and and for us, uh, we emphasize that the captain of the team represents the, the team, the team that's on the field, as well as any fans or, or anything that come to watch the game. So for us, sportsmanship encompasses everything. Anybody who's there that has any representation for your team um, goes into your sportsmanship rating. So um, that's yeah. something for us that that we we have those conversations and, and we, 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 we make sure. And again, the bottom line is this should be really fun. Um, this, this should be a, a really good avenue for, for people to to come out, have a good time, recreate with their friends, um, and, and and participate in sport. And that sportsmanship rating factors into playoff eligibility. <clears throat> Are there any other consequences other than um, postseason play? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so for us, if like if a team gets below our our sportsmanship rating is on a full point scale. Um, so if a team were to get below, say, like a two sportsmanship rating. Uh, we look at that every day um, after each each night of games. And if a team gets below a two, we're going to have some some direct conversations with that team to figure out what what went on. We'll also talk with our staff. Um, so anything that um, anything that kind of raises to a two, uh, which is often anything that uh, again kind of goes against the the student code of conduct or anything like that, we will. Uh, reach out, have conversations, and it's a, if it's a consistent issue, uh, we've also removed teams from from leagues as well um, if they're um, unable to to be good sports. And providing that education, you're at a university <laughs> where you educate, right? So education on why it's important and how to improve their behavior is really important. You know, and I know this plays into officials and how they're treated. Our country is experiencing a nationwide crisis for recruiting and maintaining sports officials to referee athletic competition. Some contributing factors include the great resignation, low wages, verbal and physical abuse from athletes, coaches, and spectators. Are you also experiencing a crisis in recruiting and maintaining sports officials? And if so, what are you doing to combat this challenge? Yes. Um, the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, you're you're right. Um, I I know locally here uh, for for high school sports as well. Uh, we uh, we're low in terms of numbers, but specifically here on campus as well. Um, and it's not just necessarily sports officials. Um, it's kind of across our our department as well. Um, but I think specifically the sports official job uh, across the country, uh, people. Like you said, they they see things that are constantly on the news, right? Um, on Facebook, on on the news, whatever else it might be, um, regarding officials and and how they're being treated. Um, so it, it's not necessarily something right now that that people want to sign up to to come do. Um, it's it for for me. I started uh, when I was at JMU. Um, that's that's how I got into this field, um, and I love it. Um, it's it's something that I, I I've learned how to how to manage that, um, how, how to deal with that. But coming into it right now um, with the current environment, that environment wasn't as, as known when I got into uh, got into it. So I think right now everybody's kind of aware of it. Um, and it's something that's that's even more of, of a barrier to, to kind of see past that to and come out. And for us on campus, we're officiating our peers as well yeah, right so, so. yeah and that's that's even tougher maybe <clears throat> officiating peers do you uh, you have the sportsmanship rating in place 
to help kind of protect the officials. Um, but what are you doing to overcome this shortage of having proper trained officials to officiate your competitive sports? <laughs> sure. Um, so, so for us, uh, something we did um, kind of coming out of COVID, uh, we, we didn't come back with, with a full sport offering um, this, this past year. Uh, we, we got back into it. We had, to, we had very little returning staff uh, when we came back um, out of COVID. Um, so when we, like, we were completely rebuilding. So we were hiring, um, hiring people who were interested in the job, um, training them. Uh, getting them on the fields, um, but again, it's it's one of those things where we we can't force people to go out and want to be a like sports official. So that that interest has to come first, and I think that that's that's the hardest part. Um, we're having conversations with people, um, kind of letting them know that we'll provide them with all all of the training that they need to be successful. Uh, but there's still questions, right? There's still those those lingering questions as to how. How do we respond if somebody is yelling at us, or or how do we respond um, if if like we make a bad call, right? Which were things before that we asked questions about, but now it's more more often more relevant. And and what do you say in response to that? How should they respond if there is some kind of issue they have to manage on the field? Sure, uh, our our biggest kind of philosophy is uh, we we don't try to meet the the participant where they are. Uh, we we, we keep trying to do our job, uh, doing it well, let the last play go. We'll talk about it later. Uh, we will debrief that, that play, that call. Um, oftentimes, I, I tell our staff as well, oftentimes we, we do make the right call according to the rules that we play by, right? So, so when we think about um, a lot of our participants, may, they may watch like the NBA, they may watch college sports. We, we follow high school rules, right? For, for most of our sports. So there's there's a difference. Um, so we teach them towards towards those rules. So being confident as well, right? So just overall confidence um, as, as soon as potentially you, you, like you let somebody see that we've, that's gotten to you, right? It's, it, doors are open and, and, it, and it might cause more problems throughout the game as well. So standing strong, being confident, um, and then we can always answer questions later. So if there's an injury that happens, what role do officials have um, at that point? When, when someone gets injured in competition, now what? What does an official do? Sure. Um, so for us, um, uh, our like officials are in charge of stopping the game, um, going over to the participant and, and calling over our uh, like supervisor staff that's there on site. Um, so, so for us, uh, we, we have medical personnel. Um, that that is on site. That that we um, it depending on injury um, scope of of injury and such, uh, we call over that um, medical personnel and and they come over. They they will take over and assess and and direct on next steps. Wow, that's incredible that you have medical staff on site. And Ryan, I know you personally have experienced several concussions that you sustained in sports and concussions are highly prevalent in sports, um, yet they can be really difficult to assess. So how has your personal experience in um, sustaining concussions influenced how you run the intramural sports program at Indiana University Bloomington? Safety first. Uh, that, it, that's the big thing, um, honestly, is um, thinking through that, that mindset. Um, uh, going through those concussions and, and, and kind of managing that, there was nothing ever that that wasn't safe about it, right? Uh, when I was participating, um, but how how do we train our staff? Um, how do we set our, our se ourselves up to be as as prepared in those in like incidents as possible? So, how do we train our staff to to recognize those things? How, how do we train to train our our staff to uh, respond quickly, right? Make like making sure but that we're being timely with our uh, response as well. And it probably is really helpful to have medical personnel on site so that um, they can sort of make that decision on return to play. I assume they they make that decision rather than the official um, themselves. Yes, yeah. A medical personnel for us, um, they they will um, determine what what happens next. Um, so if uh, there is 
say head, neck, or back injury, and uh, paramedics need to be called. Um, re a return to play wise, that, that participant cannot come back and participate in anything for, for at least 24 hours. Uh, so, um, so that's generally where that goes. Um, and then in terms of responding, that that medical personnel is the one to then determine if that person is is safe to return to play. Excellent. And you mentioned COVID earlier and how you've had to reduce the number of sport offerings, which has improved your official ratio. Um, but do you think you mentioned that you're also mentioned that your number of participants have reduced the pre post pandemic by a couple thousand students? Um, how else has COVID impacted your operations? And, um, you know, what else have you had to do uh, to kind of hone in on COVID protocols? So we're kind of towards the end here, but is there any like one or two things that you really have um, had to change? Sure. Um, over the past few years, um, since COVID started, uh, we didn't have any team sports for over a year, year and a half. Um, so we did not historically offer esports. Uh, so that's something we we brought in, um, and then as we transitioned back into offering some 1v1 type of sport offerings, a very strategic approach back to getting back to a more normal sport offering, uh, we we used a lot of policies and, and procedures um, in terms of, of cleaning, um, whether it's equipment, whether it's um, participants sanitizing. Uh, we, we did a lot to make sure that we were setting ourselves up with a very safe environment, and then as we've continue to transition, making sure that um, our participants feel safe within the, that environment as well. So, so listening with them, engaging with them as well, really hearing their, their, their perspective. Absolutely. I know weather is always something that you have to be mindful of. Um, being in the Midwest, you have to worry about tornadoes and of course, lightning storms and snow and all those sorts of things. But you also have to think about um, what kind of equipment and apparel the participants are wearing um, make sure they don't wear pockets or zippers or um, jewelry, things that can cause them injury. Are there any other major areas that you focus on to keep participants, officials, spectators safe? Sure. Um, yeah, it, everything you mentioned, um, it, especially when, like, when we think about anything that's, that's hard um, or um, could, could cause injury to somebody else. So we always think about whether it's a brace or like or anything like that, anything that could potentially cause harm. Pockets are a huge thing with flag football. Um, just just everything we can do uh, to make sure that our participants are safe, as well as the, the participants that, that they're playing against as well. Absolutely. Well, it, this has been very illuminating. So thank you, Ryan, for giving us an inside look at collegiate intramural sports. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. In two weeks time, our guest is Steve Schoenfeld, who will discuss the PGA Tour. We will see you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.